You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, Will. Hey, David. And hello, world. All of you beautiful people out there. In the world. This is Common Descent Podcast, episode 17. Welcome back. Today, we are talking about a special event. Yeah. The 2017 Annual Meeting of the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology, which I was fortunate enough to attend at the end of August. And we're going to tell you all about it. It's a big deal. It's pretty awesome. It is kind of a big deal. Before we get to that, there are a couple of announcements to make. Announcements, announcements, announcements. For starters, it is September. This is the first episode of September, which is a good time to remind all of our listeners that the Common Descent episodes in September are brought to you largely by our patrons on Patreon. Woo! Big thanks to our patrons. Uh, We, through the people who are donating money on Patreon currently, we are making enough money monthly to offset the cost of producing the podcast. Yep. So this is literally uh, uh, produced by viewers like you. Brought to you like view- by viewers like you. Viewers like you. In fact, we're actually making a little bit more than we need to produce the podcast. Yeah. So we are ideally building up a little bit of a podcast fund that will hopefully eventually allow us to do things like get better microphones and stuff. Mm-hmm. It's exciting. It is. So, if you like the podcast, and if you would like to contribute in a monetary sense, and if you would like to help us reach those goals a little bit sooner, please consider joining us on Patreon. You can donate as much as you like, as Mm -hmm. often as you like. And patrons get access to cool behind-the-scenes posts, uh, extra bonus audio recordings, And if you are, you know, depending on what level you're at, you might have the opportunity to ask us questions on the podcast, Mm -hmm. get some sweet, sweet Common Descent merchandise, or have us call your name out on the episode. We need to do. Speaking of which, we have a new patron that just recently joined, whose name on Patreon is Humanist Turtle. I love it. It's awesome. (laughs) Thank you very much, Turtle Person, for joining us. (laughs) <laughs> for joining us on Patreon. We appreciate your contribution. This is actually a person who follows us uh, on both Facebook and Twitter. Uh, so we have interacted with this person before. Thanks a ton. It Seriously, it, it's, it blows me out of the water every time that we're doing as well as we are in the Patreon ring. It's so exciting. It, I, I'm yes. excited for the future every time I look at it. We are thrilled to have people supporting us uh, on Patreon, off Patreon, and in all the ways that our listeners do. Absolutely. Thank you very much. We are going to continue doing this until you uh, stop wanting us to do it. Until you ask us not to. Uh, even then, probably. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's <laughs> we'll, we'll listen to it. You know, tell us what to do. Yeah. That's not true. Please tell us what to do. <laughs> tell us what you want us to do on the podcast. <laughs> tell us to do fun things. <laughs> So that's that. And with that, we typically would break away to our news section. This is true, but not today. Whoa! We interrupt this breaking news for even more breaking news. (laughs) We've broken the news. (laughs) We broke the news. The news is broken. We are not doing a news segment in this episode of the Common Descent Podcast. Hold your gasps. (gasps) Don't worry. I said hold it. (laughs) In mid-gasp. Mid-gasp. The audience waits silent. Um, we are not doing a news section in this episode of the podcast because a good chunk of this episode is going to be con- is going to consist of research, mm-hmm. brand new research that was presented at the meeting not too long ago. So news that you probably wouldn't even have heard about otherwise, which is actually really really exciting. Secret news. Secret news. Exciting secret news. <laughs> so let's jump in and start by introducing the society itself. Yeah. So, you will have heard 
Uh, if you've been listening in the, in the last few episodes, we've talked a bunch about SVP. And SVP is the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology. It's a scientific organization founded in 1940. It's got over 2,000 members these days. And the purpose of the organization is to foster the science of paleontology, vertebrates specifically, animals with bones, mm -hmm. and education of this science. So SVP does things like it, it has established a network, a worldwide network of vertebrate paleontologists who can work together. Mm -hmm. They produce educational materials. They have a blog on their website. They also help to inform policy. Yeah. The, uh, the, the, the officers of SVP are often involved in, you know, interacting with government officials and trying to weigh in on legal decisions that affect the conservation of lands that are particularly important for fossils. Yeah. In for, you know, or, or, or legalities surrounding fossil sale and fossil collection and things mm -hmm. like that. It's a, it's a common thing for a lot of uh, overseeing organizations like this to do. You know, AZA with zoos and aquariums deals with policy, mm -hmm. and you get lots of other you know, n national park association sort of things that oversee, and this does the same, but for paleontology. Indeed. This society, like a lot of scientific societies, also publishes a journal. Mm -hmm. The Journal of Vertebrate Paleontology, where researchers can submit and publish their original research. Uh, in fact, I have a stack of the Journal of Vertebrate Paleontology sitting next to my desk. A few. Because they keep sending it to me in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> The other thing that SVP does, perhaps the most publicly visible thing mm -hmm. and the most exciting thing for a lot of people, is that it hosts an annual meeting. The meeting of the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology. This is actually very confusing because the organization is called the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology, which is abbreviated SVP. Mm -hmm. But most of the time when you hear people talk about SVP, they're talking about the meeting. Yes. So people will say, are you going to SVP? Uh, and this is the same thing with a lot of scientific, like GSA is the Geolog Geological Society of America. Yeah. And people refer to the meeting as GSA. Yes. Because that's, like like you said, it's the it's the big news part of the society. So when you're typically talking about it, it's usually something that went on in the meeting. Yes, exactly. So SVP this year was held in at the end of August, which is earlier than usual, mm -hmm. in Calgary, in Alberta, the general, th so the, the, what happens at the meeting, there's a lot of things that actually happen at the meeting, but the big thing, the big deal is that paleontologists gather from all over the world to come together and interact with each other. Yes. You get professional paleontologists from universities, from museums, you get students, you get artists, you get merchants, um, you get teachers and journalists like yeah. myself, and just you get collectors and enthusiasts, hundreds of people. In fact, the last several years, I, I believe the meetings have broken a thousand. Yeah, it's 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 impressive for me because it's it truly is international. Like most organizations and meetings are, you know, separated by countries. This one, really, you can get people from literally every corner of the world, which is really cool. Absolutely. Now, there it, it is biased because the meeting is almost always held in the United States. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, every now and then they'll hold it overseas and you get a very different crowd. Yep. Because people who normally can't afford to come or don't have the time to come manage to go. Uh, at the meeting, all these people, what they're doing, you know, they're networking, they're catching up. One of the biggest things that happens at SVP is that people present research. Yes. For four days, there are talks, there are posters that are presenting the latest, you know, research that is recently published, research that is in the works, research that is about to be published. Mm -hmm. Just all sorts of, like, literally the cutting edge. Yeah the newest work that's going on in the field. And so for anyone who goes to conventions of any kind, be, be it comic book, car, or otherwise, 
these mm -hmm. would be equivalent to the panels that you would be going to at those where you have someone talking about something or people discussing a subject or announcing a subject. Instead of having panels at SVP, you go to people's talks and presentations of their research. And there's yeah. something going on every hour of the day in multiple different rooms. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And we'll we'll talk a little bit more about that mm -hmm. here in a bit. So you get to see and, – and actually, I like your comparison with conventions. Mm -hmm. Will just got back from Dragon Con. So it's, uh, it's fresh on the mind. <laughs> <laughs> when I was in Less college, cosplaying at SVP. <laughs> there, there is actually cosplaying at SVP. 100%. We'll talk more about that, too. <laughs> Everybody comes dressed up as a as a paleontologist. As your as your <laughs> yes, in the cargo pants and mm -hmm. the, the vests in the ceremonial garb. <laughs> there was ceremonial garb this year actually, because <laughs> it was in Calgary. The president at the welcome reception, the president of the society, and uh, other officers were presented with the ceremonial Calgary white cowboy hat. Oh. And then they had to read an oath to uphold the image of Calgary, because Calgary is the best of the Canadian cities. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, no, it was it was super fun. I, it was I, really cool. I really need to go to Canada someday. <laughs> Canada's a cool place. But anyway, I like your your comparison to a convention because when I was an undergraduate and I first started going to SVP. And my friends, I had friends who were all computer scientists, and they were like, why, what is this? And they were also huge dorks, mm -hmm. like super nerds, and they, and they, you know, went to conventions like nerds do, like we do. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know what? I'm going to put this in a term you can easily understand. SVP is PaleoCon. Yep. That's pretty much exactly what it is. Absolutely. And it's, it's, it, it has, if you really, if you think of it in that context... It explains a lot of what goes on there, and you can predict a lot of what goes on there, which is awesome. There's the the research presentations. Mm -hmm. There's there are vendors booths. Yeah. There are special workshops that go on. Mm -hmm. There are field trips that are associated a lot of the time, since you know to to nearby museums, to yeah. nearby fossil sites, things like that. There is a big charity auction that happens every year. There is an awards banquet where uh, members of the society are granted various different awards for their contributions. It's a big old festival for four days in a new place every year. So this year, it was in Calgary. Uh, Will, which SVP did you go to? It, so I remember the the year it, we were. It was in. It was nearby. Oh, it was Raleigh. Yes, it was Raleigh. Thank you. I I remember it was really close. That was why it was easy for me to go, and it was like my I think it was like my second semester in oh, okay. grad school, and man, was I overwhelmed because <laughs> not only was there a ton to do, but I had not yet had enough education to actually know what any of the talks I went to were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so I sat in the back of a lot of them, and I was also like overachieving new students so i was like trying to take notes on stuff oh yeah and like I, like i think some part of me thought i was going to be quizzed when we got back uh <laughs> and oh i i but man it was awesome i i've yet to get to go back to an svp went to sevp uh seavp yep. but need to go back someday yeah there are a lot of smaller conferences mm -hmm. we've been to seavp a couple times i went to svp for the first time as an undergraduate in 2008 in Cleveland, mm -hmm. and I have missed only two since then. So I, I am a I am an SVP regular. It's a lifer. I'm a li well, yeah, almost. <laughs> <Someday>. <laughs> I've been going for uh, this. I think was my eighth SVP, and I, I've been as a student and as a researcher. And these days I go as a journalist mm -hmm. and an educator. This year it was in Calgary in Alberta, and. The Calgary area is really cool for paleontology. That's one of the things that, that the, the, the area is chosen for in a lot of cases is that there are paleontological associations there that can host them. So, for example, you know, the, the, the Calgary meeting was hosted in large part by folks from the University of Calgary. Yeah. Um, oftentimes there's a nearby museum 
uh, in Raleigh, you know, you've got uh, n- there's a number of North Carolina universities that are nearby that mm-hmm. contribute to paleontological research. So in Calgary, you've got the University of Calgary, but you're also within easy driving distance of things like the Burgess Shale, mm-hmm. which we talked about in our Cambrian Explosion episode. Uh, you are near to Dinosaur Provincial Park, which oh, is right. a huge dinosaur fossil site. Super important area. We were not too distant from the Royal Terrell Museum, which is full of all sorts of dinosaurs. The Terrells. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta watch out for them. They'll poison know, yes, your drinks. They, yeah, no, they, they're they're nothing but trouble. <laughs> so Calgary is a cool location. This this conference itself took place in downtown Calgary, and there were all sorts of opportunities for people to explore mm-hmm. the paleontology of the nearby areas. And we will talk about that a little bit in a little bit. But first, the news. A bunch of it. A bunch of news. So this is a, this is a little bit different, mm-hmm. right? Because normally what we do is we pick a few articles from the news about new research and we talk about them. Yes. What I'm going to do here is go through a bunch of research that was presented at SVP this year mm-hmm. and talk about sort of, you know, what what the presentations were. Some of these things have been written about in articles that we can link in the blog post. Other things have not been published yet. Other things are you're you're basically getting information about research that has not been made available anywhere outside of SVP, which is pretty cool. A quick note about just how much research is presented at SVP. Yes. There are two ways that researchers can go about this. There are talks. Mhm. So there are symposium sessions, technical sessions that are given in the mornings and afternoons. And these are back-to-back 15-minute presentations. The researchers get up there. They've got a big PowerPoint projector, big screen. They give their talk on their research. These go on for four days. Uh, There were three separate sections going on simultaneously each of the four days in the morning and the afternoon. Mm -hmm. And then after all the talks are done, there is a two-hour poster session every day. Mm-hmm. where other researchers put together posters that hang up on these little walls and they stand in front of their posters and people can walk around and talk with them in front of their poster while they show people the sort of research that they're doing. The, to visualize the poster for anyone who hasn't who hasn't seen a scientific poster before, think kind of of the, the infographics, the, the information panels that you'd see in a museum. Where it's yeah, it's giving you pictures of their research, some of the you know maybe the data or the graphs, and some paragraphs, the abstract for their research, and some paragraphs or or quick explanations for what they were doing, what they found, and what this tells them. So it's it's a very condensed version of a paper in a visual format. Yes, exactly. They can be really cool. Yeah, they can, and some of the some of them this year were really really fun. Uh, the cool thing about posters and even and talks as well is that a lot of the time this is research in, in progress. Mm-hmm. So it's an opportunity for researchers to get some feedback before they go on to finalizing their work or before they go on to whatever the next step is. It's it's something that you don't typically see in actual science news. You see it in like movies and TV shows all the time where it's like, we're interviewing so-and-so scientist who's currently working on a new blah, 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 that will eventually become the crux of that episode or whatever it is. Right. But this is literally them saying, this is what we're currently doing. And a lot of times they'll have things of like, we found a couple of things so far, but often they're like, no, this is what we're doing. This is what we're planning. Here's some of the clips or pictures, but you know, we don't have the answer yet because we're not done yet. Yeah. Which is cool. Absolutely. You don't typically get to see science midway through. Yeah. And these researchers, again, I I, I want to stress the diversity of the crowd Mm -hmm. here. All different countries. Mm -hmm. There are undergraduates presenting research all the way up to people who have been doing this for literally decades. Mm -hmm. You get some some, some people from museums, people from all walks of life. It will post a couple pictures on the the blog, so that you can see what the crowd looks like. Yes, it is a very varied and and wonderful crowd of people. 
which is really interesting as someone going because you could be bumping into you know a student who's been researching or studying or just you know participating in the field no longer than you have or mm -hmm. someone who has written the books that you read in undergrad <laughs> <laughs> yeah and you get to meet those people right mm -hmm. this year at SVP I got to meet a bunch of people that I interact with on the internet, like a bunch of people that I follow on Twitter and who mm -hmm. follow me from other museums and other universities, which is really cool. I got to meet on the plane there. I was sitting near a student who is an undergraduate who was presenting research for, I think the first time maybe mm -hmm. at SVP. But I also got to meet like Phil Curry <laughs> this year at SVP who is one of the, in fact, Phil Curry at the end of this year's SVP was awarded the highest award that SVP offers to members for lifetime achievement. Pretty awesome. So you get to meet all sorts of people. Between the talks and the posters, there are, and I added this up, I did some quick math beforehand, <laughs> between the four days, three talk sessions a day, about 100 posters presented each day, there are approximately 700 research projects presented over the course of SVP. Which is astounding. It is incredible. This year's SVP had an attendance of a little over 1,000 people, which means most people were there presenting some mm -hmm. work in one fashion or another. This also means that I did not see all of the research. Yes. Uh, because it is physically impossible. Until I get my dream and I have multiple manpowers. Yeah, we're working on it. I am unable to see all the, the presentations, and I do not have time to talk about all of them, which is a shame because all of them are awesome. And this is also something I think that is important to to mention, just because it's it's easy to forget the things that are behind the scenes. You know, sort of like it's really easy to not think about the people who made the props in the movie you love. Mm -hmm. When we do our you know biweekly you know news session for science news we always talk about the fact that there was a lot of cool news articles or you know we're we're picking from a w wide variety the variety of news articles we have to pick one from is still just a minute amount of the actual publications and research oh yeah that has gone out or been published or come out in that amount of time because it's insane how much is being done just a lot of it is either a a, a a a renaming of a species or a a a redoing of a previous study mm -hmm. or they may be something that's just incredibly specific yeah that that's such a narrow field it's really hard to report on it without giving all the background of the bigger field and so it's yeah we're only even when you're seeing the news and keeping your fingers to the pulse of science news you're still only seeing a fraction of what's actually coming out by scientists, just within paleontology, once again. This is just paleontologists. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the journals, new journal issues come out all the time, and they have dozens of new papers in them. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the, the information and the new stuff that is presented at SVP offers a really cool opportunity to look at some of those nitty-gritty, intricate kind of studies. Yeah, it's really nice. So let's look at some of those. Yay. Because there are about 700 presentations given at SVP, I had to choose which ones I wanted to focus on to share on the podcast. For, for anyone who listened to the But We Digress million years a second timeline of Earth, it's going to be like that. It's going to be like the last <laughs> minute of that. Super, super quick. <laughs> yeah. They discovered um, this, they did this research, that, they did this. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on, next one. All right. 699 left to go. <laughs> I decided that it would be cool... While I was there, I decided to focus in on some of the research that is related to things we've talked about on the podcast before. Ooh, nice. Starting with snakes. Uh, I mean, if you're, I guess if you have to start somewhere. Snakes. <laughs> so there are there were a bunch of different fossil snake presentations at SVP this year. Oh, cool. There were a few that stood out for me because we've mentioned things about them on the podcast before. Mm-hmm. So one thing that caught my eye was a presentation, this is actually a poster presentation by Jonathan Rio over in the UK about Gigantophis. 
Oh. So, episode three, listeners may remember that we talked about uh, snake fossil history, and Gigantophis is the once upon a time holder of the title of biggest snake in Mm -hmm. history. This poster was very simple, very straightforward, the kind of thing that is done in paleontology all the time and not often reported on, Mm -hmm. which is a re-diagnosis of the species. Yeah. So what they basically did was they looked at a number of different specimens reported to be Gigantophis. Mm -hmm. This was a a big snake from the Paleogene period. In over over in Africa and the Middle East, mm-hmm. uh, as we reported before, right, seven or eight meters long, big old snake. What they did was they looked at a bunch of different, you know, they they came at it with fresh eyes. They went through all the different traits on yeah. uh, largely vertebrae because that's what you typically get with snakes. And basically, we're trying to say, all right, how much do we actually know? Are we confident that all these bones actually go to this snake? What do, you know, what does this tell us about its relationships? And this is super common. But what they found was they identified a couple of defining characteristics that haven't been reported on before. Mm-hmm. Basically saying, all right, everybody, we, we took a closer look. These are some traits that you can use to identify this particular taxon, this particular species. Mm-hmm. And because of that redefinition, this uh, they were arguing suggests that some of the vertebrae that have been called Gigantophis are not Gigantophis, vertebrae specifically that come from Pakistan, and if they're right, that means that this species, this genus, is so far only known from Africa. Mm -hmm. And so this, again, sort of nitty-gritty rediagnosis is allowing them to more confidently state what defines this species, and refines our understanding of where they were living, what sort of features they were having, what their relationship is to other snakes. Yeah. The, these kind of studies and, res- and researches that go on really are what define the images, focus in on some of more of the details for species or locations or eras. And it's in, and, and you mentioned already, but it, these things typically don't get mentioned because if you were to just glance at the paper that initially described the fossils and this paper, they'd look very similar because mm-hmm. they're doing effectively the same job of we're going to look at these fossils and try to identify everything as best we can. But as you said, fresh eyes and new knowledge, sometimes new yeah. technology can make big differences. And to me, it always it makes me think of like when you're working on like a crossword or a word search or something like that, and you just can't figure something out. And then someone walks up and it's like, oh, what about that? <laughs> yeah, basically. Because they haven't been looking at it the way you've been looking at it for the last years or 30 minutes or whatever the thing is. Yeah. They can come at it from a different angle or, or a different mindset. Yeah. And oftentimes with new material. Yes. You know, we've got a couple different fossils. We've got a new technique, a new Mm -hmm. computer program. You know, if we we found a new skull for this species, why not look at everything, not just the new skull? You know? Yes. So stuff like that. If you you get a new piece, might as well do it all over again, because not only is that going to make the picture more complete, but also it gives you a double check. If you come up with the same answer, great. It's even more stable. It's even more, yeah. you know, a, a reliable answer. So th- this is the the bit by bit building of our understanding mm-hmm. of what ancient species were like, where they lived, when they lived, go- is is built on a bunch of little diagnoses like this. Exactly. Yeah. The, it's putting the single nails into the structure. Yes. You know, one one study at a time. Uh, another study that was a, uh, uh, similar in the sense that it's some new snake material mm-hmm. comes from <laughs> in, Randall... in the sense that it didn't have legs. In the sense that it didn't have legs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is Randall Nidum from Arizona, who mm-hmm. another poster presenting on new fossils of a snake called, and this is wonderful, Diablophus. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's good stuff. Uh, Diablophus is exciting because you'll remember from the snake episode, we mentioned that the earliest known snake fossils come from the Jurassic. 
Yes. Well, this is one of them. Oh. And so this is a report on new material from the Morrison Formation, the very famous Morrison Formation in the Western United States. And this is another one of those little cool studies where it's this this taxon, this species, has already been named. This is what appears to be more material of it. And what it does is it kind of fleshes out our understanding of the animal a little bit more. In this case, what they're finding on this new material, which is uh, some skull, you know, I had a jaw and some vertebrae, is a mix of snake features and features you wouldn't expect to see in snakes, but that you would expect to see in lizards. Nice. Right. Intricacies of the structure of the bones, the the little traits that are here and there, right? The general shape, the general structure, and the general function of these mm -hmm. bones is this transition, right? This early stage of snakes where they hadn't yet developed all the cool snake features, but they hadn't yet lost all those holdover lizard features. Very cool. Yeah, neat. Just a little report from the early days of snake evolution. See, I, that's one. Of, that was one of my favorite things about SVP, and one of the things I think it brings to light really well is typically when people think of like an animal and the f list of facts we have about it, it, it either gets portrayed or it's easy to see that as well. Someone studied the animal and learned all those things, mm -hmm. which is almost never what happens. Now you get some yes. cases where a person, you know, a single person or a single team does just add the bulk of the knowledge you know they they yeah go above and beyond or they really dedicate their life to it but the best way to think of a, an image a, a body of knowledge of an animal if you were to picture it as a painting is like pointillism and every point yeah. is a bit of research and every time we do more research we add in a little more definition to where when you step back again it looks a little higher definition i like that and that's that's how I uh, that's how I think of these things because we think of facts as like well it's the list of things you learned when you looked at the animal. It's like no, it's the right. list of things we learned by comparing what everyone else learned. Yes. You can't get, really get a picture if you just followed one person's research, you would have a very narrow view of an animal. But by following that and another and another and another, you can put together all the picture and compare them. Yes, we we we've often said in that podcast that one study does not make. A conclusion. Yeah, right? it's not they, a they, fact make. Yes, exactly. These are the kinds of studies that go into that refinement. And it's really, it's it's a cool, and it's the cool thing about SVP is that it's not just that you're learning about it, but the person's there. Yeah, and you can talk to them. Yeah, which is really, really, it's intimidating sometimes, but it's cool. Oh, it's so cool. The last snake bit that I wanted to mention is, this was actually a talk mm -hmm. by Hong Yu Yi uh, in Beijing about another very early snake, the snake called Dinalesia, which I think I mentioned in episode three, was a Cretaceous terrestrial snake. And one of the big arguments that has gone on with uh, over this, over Dinalesia, is we're not sure what its habits were. Mm -hmm. Because some people have suspected that it was just a general crawling around on the ground snake, and others have suggested that it was a burrower. Yes. So Yi presented an analysis of the semicircular canals in the skull of the snake. Oh. So these are the little chambers. You have them in your ear region, and they're part of the balance apparatus yeah. of an animal. And a number, a lot of studies have been done on various animals where you're looking at the shape of the balance apparatus to see how it correlates with your habits. Yeah, exactly. Obviously, like if you're swinging through the trees, you need a different balance mechanism mm -hmm. than if you're walking on the ground. What they found was that when they look at living lizards and snakes, they found a good correlation between the different shape of the canals in burrowers versus non-specific, you know, just crawling wherever or walking wherever kind of animals. Interesting. And yeah, they, they do basically the... There's different parts of the canals, and some of them are longer, and some of them mm -hmm. are shorter, depending on what the habits of this animal is. And their results indicate that Denalesia groups with the burrowing squamates. Oh, that's fascinating. How cool is that? I would have never, I, I would not have su suspected that being on the ground versus under it was enough to change the way your your equilibrium center. Yeah, I would don't. Be. I, I, 
admittedly, I don't know why that is. Yeah, or, yeah, or no. the full details. But the fact that there is a trend, yeah, is interesting. <laughs> so cool. A few little snake tidbits from SVP this year. There you go. Um, I can't think of any other groups of animals that worth we focusing highlight, on. Really. Um, this is, by the way, we forgot to mention this. This is the last episode of, <laughs> of Descent. Which, which, no, it's not. It's just going to be just me from now on. It's, it's the last good episode of Common Descent. <laughs> well, and ever since, ever since Will left, and that, yeah, it just wasn't, just wasn't the same. Will is the Radar O'Reilly of the Common Descent podcast. <laughs> Dave just keeps quoting things and sighing when no one responds. <laughs> So there was a bunch of cool croc stuff yeah, at SVP this year as well. Some of it was just cool. Like sometimes you, you know, you, you want to look at, you know, what are the, what's the broader significance and there's always broader significance. Sometimes it's just really pretty. Yeah. And there was a croc that was presented in a talk this year. That's just really pretty. It comes from the Triassic of North Carolina. It was okay. presented by Susan Drymala, who is of North Carolina, and it is a, it is a very early crocodilomorph. And what makes it interesting is that it is missing some parts of the skull. It is missing the tip of its tail, mm-hmm. and that's it. Wow! It is an extraordinarily complete specimen. If I can get a picture of it, I will share it. It preserves details of the limbs, which are extremely rare Yeah. in crocodilomorphs. According to Susan, I asked her about it. Mm-hmm. It even preserves par- uh, some of the osteoderms from the tail. Oh, wow. So the bits of bony armor. It's super neat. It looks great. And it's a new taxon. It's a new species. Oh, wow. Yeah. Not named yet. But anytime you get a new species, and this is something that you know, whenever we report on new species, we always talk about it like, oh, it's a new species. What was its habits? What, were, what was mm-hmm. its habitat? Where was it? What was it doing? But one of the biggest great things that happens when you get a new species is now you have a new data point to yes. throw into your evolutionary tree. Yes. And every time a paleontologist reports on a new species, they throw it into the phylogeny. Yes. Uh, we talked about that a whole bunch in episode 10, taxonomy and phylogeny. So Susan and colleagues threw this new taxon into the phylogeny, and what's great about having a wonderfully complete taxon like this, uh, a complete specimen like this, is that not only do you have a new data point because it's a new species, Mm -hmm. but all those parts of the body are now new data points. Yes, there's things you can compare to any other parts you have from other specimens. Yes, so you can compare limb bones, and you can compare, like, this specimen can be compared to just about every other known specimen, because almost the whole body is there. Which is really cool. Which is really great. That make make a big dent. I'm going to have a a, a comparison metaphor for everything going back to arts and crafts. Uh, (laughs) This, 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 it it made, made me think when you're talking about refining the phylogeny or, or, or adding a data point to it is every time you get a new species for a clade is mm-hmm. like adding, if you were doing a connect the dots, but you only got to add a dot every time you found. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Is, is you're slowly refining the overall picture of that group. Every time yeah. you find a new one, it might completely shift things, but if our you know if our techniques are to be trusted, we are slowly but surely reaching a more correct layout for their relationships. Which is that's yeah. the reason new species are exciting. Is it's not just that it, oh it's new, but it has the potential to confirm, shift, and refine or rewrite aspects of the relationships. Yeah, and what that tells us is then you know when when did this feature show up? Mm-hmm. How widespread is this feature, and what does that tell us about its history? When did they what start doing this? What feature showed up before? What other feature? Yeah. yeah, and it it refines our picture, right? We can get information about evolution of a group without having all the extinct species of yes. that group. And we do that through phylogeny. Shows us the, the secession of, and arising of traits. Yes. Which is important. <laughs> 
because that also teaches us a lot about what rates does evolution happen at and how do these things progress and change. Indeed. And in fact, there was another specimen that was presented. In fact, this may have been back to back. I don't remember. Oh, it'd be a great 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> it was, no, there was a whole croc session. Yeah. Oh, there was yeah. A whole croc session. That. There was a whole snake session. Yeah, I forgot that. They put all they, the similar talks together usually. That they will group them like that. That's awesome. Yeah. There was another new species presented by Octavio Mateus from Portugal. Mm -hmm. uh, Mateus is from Portugal, and so is the new fossil. Uh, Cretaceous in age, Genius. about 95 million years old. Another new species, again, exciting, cool, new croc. Again, not named because we're at SVP, right? These yep. don't have names yet. They're not officially published yet. So what you get is a lot of, look at this cool specimen. It's a new species. Find out the name in a few months when it comes out <laughs> in a journal. We can tell it's different. We're still in the process of of getting all the, the paperwork. Yes, and you do not name... Uh, the, the way that naming works is it can only be named in a scientific publication. Yes. And that is important because when that when that rule has been broken in the past, it has led to some interesting fiascos. It, it, it's a it's a much more complicated, basically, version of dibs. If you, if you, <laughs> you don't get to name it because you saw it first. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> so Mateus's Portugal specimen is exciting because based on the features of the skeleton mm -hmm. and then when they plugged all those features into that evolutionary tree it suggests that this is a very basal right at the at the beginnings of the clade mm -hmm. a very basal member of true crocodilia oh so remember episode two right this isn't the weird croc cousins from the past the actual crocodilians like the all the modern crocs fit into that group and if that is the case, this is the earliest known crocodilian. Wow. Which is exciting, not only because you know, that's a cool claim to fame. Yes. It tells uh, it has the potential to tell us what the earliest crocodilians looked like. Yeah. In terms of which specific features of the skull, of the limbs, you know, whatever other parts of the skeleton you have, which features had already shown up. Mm-hmm. And possibly where they were. Yeah. If the earliest crocodilian is found in Portugal, does that mean that this clade, this group, evolved in Europe? Yeah, branched out from there. Yeah, so it, this has the potential to give us lots of cool information about the crocodilian family tree and evolutionary history. That's really cool. That stuff's always fascinating because it's the... When you can find those basal traits... You know that tells that can tell you a lot about later on relationships. You know we we talked about that. You know if if you find a trait that is in every single modern group, it means the ancestor most likely had it. But when you find that ancestor, getting to see whether it does or not can really change the picture depending on yeah what the what you end up finding, which is cool. Yeah. Now, granted, the exact definition of the group crocodilia is a subject of much discussion. A lot of the groups are. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> as we've discussed before, right, the, the line between crocodilia and not crocodilia is arbitrary. Yes. Like, we made that up, right, where we decide where the names start. Mm -hmm. So trying to define it is always a bit of a, you know, we have to pick and choose which features we want to say, all right, this is the part where we're going to start yeah. calling it crocodilia. Where, where do you draw the line? And that line can constantly get picked yeah. up and put down slightly to the left or right as you learn more or as new research comes out. So there's much more discussion to be had, mm -hmm. certainly. Another, uh, one more croc piece, real quick one. Thoracosaurus is a marine crocodilian from the Cretaceous and perhaps the early Paleocene, I believe. Research presented by Kristen Vogel, I think of North Dakota identified proteins in marine crocodilian bones. What? Which is cool. So this is, uh, we've talked a bit about molecular paleontology before. Big new thing that we can identify bits of microscopic soft tissue in ancient creatures. It's been done for dinosaurs. It's been done for uh, plenty of, uh, of ancient groups. Mm-hmm. This is a very, very rare example. In fact, I, the, the abstract claim that it's only the second time wow. that 
protein in endogenous biomolecules, as it calls them, oh, have course. been found in a marine animal. Interesting. And in this case, they dissolved a femur and found collagen. Oh. Uh, which is a very, very common protein that makes up the, you know, the structure of cells and, and, and all sorts of sort of connective tissues in the body. Yes. Uh, the way that, that, that researchers identify biomolecules, uh, in this case, they actually use several different methods. But one method that I think is really fascinating that I learned about at last year's SVP is called immunofluorescence. Right, right, right. And what you do is, right, so the body is full of antibodies, mm -hmm. little molecules that the immune system uses to send messages between cells. And antibodies yes. are built such that they recognize certain proteins and con and attach to them. Yeah, this you typically hear about them when you know, your science classes talk about the immune system because mm -hmm. those particular antibodies are recognizing proteins on viruses or bacteria or yes. other or other foreign bodies. Uh, but yes. they're used in many more things. So what they do to, for example, identify collagen is they get the bone, the material that they want to see if there's collagen in it. They get a bunch of collagen antibodies ah. and they stick a fluorescent molecule on the other end of the antibody <laughs> and then throw the antibodies at the place where they hope the proteins are. And if there's collagen there, in this case, the antibodies will latch onto it, and then when you scan it, it will glow. See, that's so cool. <laughs> how cool is that? And that's how you know that the protein that you're looking for is there. Here, here you go, little antibodies. We're going to give you this little light bulb. Yeah. And you go do your job. Don't, you, don't even worry about it. We'll do the rest. <laughs> that's so, so cool. And in this case, it was corroborated by a handful of different methods that were to check, are we finding this protein? Is it a false signal that mm -hmm. is in all the sediments, or is it just in this bone? And multiple approaches indicate that this is indeed a very rare case, at least so far, a, a rare example of proteins, and possibly others besides collagen, being found in a marine species as a fossil. That's so cool. And it's a marine croc. Nice. Yeah. That's awesome. It's good stuff. So another subject that we talked about in a previous episode, switching away from snakes and crocs, you know, we've got the good stuff out of the way first. Yep. Start strong. Move on. <laughs> it's all downhill from here, folks. <laughs> it was all downhill once I finished the snakes. <laughs> another subject that we talked about in episode eight was devoted to conservation and paleontology, mm -hmm. which was all about how we can use evidence from the fossil record to inform our conservation efforts in in the modern day saving species using examples from the past well at this year's svp there was a talk given this was really cool because you, you don't I, I don't think i've ever seen a talk like this at svp before or quite exactly like this this is a talk by graham lloyd from the uk where basically he analyzed how our priorities for conservation can be affected by our understanding of fossil species. Oh. And the way that it works is this. He introduced this idea. Well, I don't think he introduced it in general. I think it's an existing idea. He introduced it to me. Right? Yes. I didn't, I'd never heard of it. This is a metric called EDGE, Evolutionary Distinctiveness and Extinction Risk. And oh. what this does is it basically looks, obviously it's comparing the, how risk how how at risk a species is mm -hmm. versus how unique it is evolutionarily yes and the way that you determine evolutionary uniqueness is by looking at their evolutionary tree right their phylogeny mm -hmm. and seeing how many close relatives they have mm -hmm. and how long they have been separate from other species. Oh, okay. So, for example, if you looked at, you know, the finches in the Galapagos. Or, or right? like the, the nautiloids in our, our last episode where they've been on their own branch from yes the, the squids and the octopus for quite a while. Exactly. So if you have a species that is one of a whole, if you take like a beetle, 
mm-hmm. right? You have a species of beetle that belongs to a family of beetles that has a, a bajillion species, and they all evolved within the last couple million years. That would be a low evolutionary distinctive that value. Yeah, very short branches and paths. They're, they're yeah. all... Compared to, for example, the Tuatara, yes, which has no living relatives that it shares an ancestor with more recently than 250 million years ago or so. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like This is a branch that has been separated from all other living branches for at least 200 million years and is only one living species. Yes. So basically you're using your understanding of the evolutionary history of groups to determine, right, obviously those are extreme examples. Yes. But you're basically saying, all right, how much of a priority should this be given how unique it is biologically, evolutionarily, and how risky it, its, its situation is. But phylogeny changes depending on what f- inputs you're using. Mm-hmm. And we talked about this in a bunch of previous episodes, where if you look at just DNA, you're going to get a different tree versus if you look at skeletal features mm-hmm. versus if you include fossils or not. So what this, what, what Lloyd's presentation was, was he looked at, sorry, crocodiles. <laughs> in fact, he, he looked at all the modern crocodilian species, and he constructed different evolutionary trees where he included fossil data in some and didn't include fossil data in others. Yes. And looked at how the inclusion of fossils in his data changed the conservation priorities. Yeah. Based on how it affected the evolutionary relationships. Interesting. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah, it's it's a very specific and it's very technical, but the the take home there is putting fossils into your tree, right, into those data points with all your different traits, changes the information that we can use to decide where to focus our conservation yeah. efforts in modern species. You know, looking at it one way would give you one answer for who should get the most attention, but adding that extra information of the fossils could give you a completely different one. Yeah, and he pointed out that it's not just how ancient the group is, and it's not just how diverse the group is. There's also the factor of how quickly the species in the group are replaced. Yeah. That if it's if it's a, a group that evolves new species and, and turns over its, its species quickly versus something that where the species survive for a very, very long time with comparatively little change. Yeah can also change your value. So yeah, like all sorts of details looking into the evolutionary history of a group in, in deciding how important it is to conserve in the modern day. It's interesting how complex those things can be. We recently were looking at vulnerab- you know, uh, uh, conservation statuses of modern animals mm-hmm. at work, and I decided to dig a little bit deeper because I realized I don't actually know what the criteria is to shift something from vulnerable to threatened to endangered to critically endangered right right you know so on and so forth i don't actually know what it is they're looking at because it you know is it just numbers is it and there's a there's a number of criteria from yeah habitat range if the habitat's being destroyed at a certain rate then that animal is going to be put in danger even if we're not seeing the drop in population yet you know populations there occupation range how much space are the animals actually taking up Mm-hmm. The, there's another one for, I think I think it was the rate at which the population is changing you know, or decreasing. And it's like four or five different criteria, much like this one, where it's not one simple answer. You actually have to take in a whole bunch of things and factor them together, and that gives you somewhere on the scale. Yeah. Which is really cool. All sorts of cool details. And then you throw fossils into the mix, and it's even more complicated. Yeah, it, it adds a whole new layer <laughs> Another piece that I wanted to mention because we did a whole episode about Antarctica. Yeah, there we was, did. Yeah, we did. We did uh, episode 11? 11. There was a presentation. I'll make this quick. Just a quick, it's another quick little note. Mm-hmm. By Nathan Smith from California. New fossil material of Cryolophosaurus. <gasps> yeah, yeah, yeah. I like the that Antarctic one. theropod dinosaur. 
that we talked about a little bit back in that other episode. This is a lot like some of the, the, the those earlier research pieces that we were mentioning. New material means new information about the species, mm-hmm. which changes our understanding of where it comes from and what it's related to. What's interesting about this new material is that it includes another brain case oh. and two left fibulae, which means that they know there are at least two cryolophosauruses in the Hansen formation, nice. which is cool. Uh, they were also able to CT scan the skull of the original specimen, the holotype. Mm-hmm. And this was, it's interesting because the phylogeny here, cryolophosaurus is this big question mark in terms of where it fits, because it's a very early theropod. Mm-hmm. And so where it fits in the theropod family tree is important for telling us what was going on in early theropod evolution. Yeah. Uh, what they found is, in this particular instance, is that th- it is the closest related, in terms of dinosaurs we know of, to Dilophosaurus. Oh, cool. The one with the two crests. The one that did not spit poison or have a frilled lizard crest around its neck, but was nonetheless nope. a cool dinosaur. Yes, it was. Yeah. Interesting. Another piece of research that has to do with an episode that we had late uh, earlier... I'm not going to tell you which episode this relates to just yet. I'm going to let it be a little bit of a surprise. Mystery. Mystery. Intrigue. I'm burying the lead, as they say. Oh, ho, ho. I, this... I'm hooked. <laughs> oh, I got him. I got him, guys. <laughs> I, the boss I is on how this, ends. this is from Katja Waskow uh, from Germany. She presented on sauropods from a bone bed in the Morrison Formation of Montana called the Mother's Day Quarry. I don't know why it's called the Mother's Day Quarry, but it sounds cool. You're being silly. We haven't even done an episode on these yet. I know, right? Oh, mystery. (laughs) Why why am I even talking about this? (laughs) Basically, what she aimed to do, what what it sounds like she was starting out doing, was trying to see if they could learn about sauropod growth history, right? Mm -hmm. how fast they grew when they attained uh, maturity, by cutting through the ribs. Yeah. And they looked at this one quarry because this quarry is all juvenile sauropods. Or at least it was thought to be all juvenile sauropods. But what happened, what, what she found, what they found, I suppose, when they looked at the growth curves, the growth information in these ribs, is that these are mostly fully mature sauropods that are just very small. Yeah! <laughs> Which is interesting because there's other dinosaurs of this group, right? These are the diplo- the, 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 the diplodocids, mm-hmm. sauropods like Diplodocus and, and Apatosaurus. Other Morrison diplodocids are big, right? Oh. They're normal, uh, what you expect sauropods to be. These were sauropods that were not growing beyond the size of a young sauropod. Which is really interesting because we know from episode four... Insular dwarfism. That dwarfism happens on islands. But there is no geological evidence for an island here. Interesting. So either they were dwarfed for some other reason, which would be a big mystery, Mm -hmm. or this could be, again, research in progress, this could be skeletal evidence of an ancient island. That's... Awesome. Where we don't have the geologic evidence for, right? This was a time where the uh, the, the 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 seaway, mm-hmm. right? There were seaways invading the land, and so as these seaways in in the in the central part of North America were waxing and waning, they could have created islands for geologically brief periods of time. Yes, exactly. Like they, they come in, all hills and mountains become islands. Mm-hmm. And then they come out, and now your neighbors are your neighbors again. Yes. So this could be a a previously unrecognized island that contained dwarf sauropods here in North America. That's so cool. <laughs> How cool is that? How weird must that have been for the big ones? <laughs> <They've> <laughs> met you up see again. those guys on the island over it's there? Like, <laughs> oh, man, that sea was weird. Hey, why are you so small? <laughs> <laughs> well, you got Lord of the Flies going on over there on that island. We just assumed you were far away. <laughs> <laughs> but we walked up closer and you didn't get any bigger. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, that's why I was shouting. <laughs> I'm right here. <laughs> I'm almost 
was the oh there you go. <laughs> uh, the other thing that they noticed was that the growth curve showed, uh, it at least seems to show, that these dwarf sauropods were reaching maturity at the same age as normal sized sauropods. Oh, fascinating! So they were growing for the same amount of time, just slower. Yeah, they they were slowed their rate, but it was the same uh, ratio. That's awesome. Yeah, so they didn't like. It's not like they grew at the same speed and just stopped earlier. Mm-hmm. They grew more slowly, which is really cool. It, it's it's literally once again like you took a the corner of an image on on you know on the computer and slid it down. You're you're just scaling everything down. Yup. But it's still functioning the same. That's really really interesting. Indeed. Also, there was a bunch of research presented from our old friends at the Gray Fossil Site. I know them. Yeah, so we did a whole episode on the Gray Fossil Site as well. Mm-hmm. Episode 14. I don't remember any of the numbers. <laughs> I remember. Oh, I know all of them. I know They're you. stuck in my, my mind file cabinet. You, you, you remember which Pokemon they, each one is. <laughs> Kuna. So Cheyenne Crow presented on squirrels from the gray site. Danielle Oberg presented on moles from the gray site. Josh Samuels, uh, who is a new professor down there who joined the team uh, a little while ago, Mm -hmm. uh, has been going over basically a big swath of all the little creatures, rodents and rabbits and, and little things like that, to see if he can refine the age of the site. Right. So we discussed in that episode how our estimate for how old the site is is based on what species were there, right? Biostratigraphy. Like this species originated at this time, this species went extinct at this time, so we can bracket how old the site is. Yes. The Gray Fossil Site's bracket is based on two big animals, the bear and the rhino. Mm-hmm. What Josh is trying to do is look at lots of little animals and see if he can refine it even further, which is pretty yeah. cool. Zooming in instead of zooming out. Yeah. And then our old friend Blaine Schubert. Uh-huh. Uh, hey, that's that was a pun I didn't even intend. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> Blaine Schubert, former professor of ours, Will's old advisor, mm-hmm. and the guy that Steve and I named the Gray Snake after. Yes. Presented on just astonishing research that he is doing down in the Yucatan in Mexico. Mm -hmm. Have you seen the pictures that he is bringing back from this place? I've seen it. I've seen a few. I've, I've I've only been back online for a few days. So I've, I've been seeing a few of his posts, but I haven't gotten a look at them in detail. It's it's, he's like, Hey, look where I'm doing paleontology. It's paradise. (laughs) I, I go to this tropical Island where everything's beautiful he is, with a bunch of other colleagues, pulling Ice Age fossils out of blue holes, cenotes, oh, right. right? water-filled yes. sinkholes in the Yucatan, specifically one called Hoyo Negro, which I think means black hole or something very similar to it. Cool. In this particular cave, there are, you know, and it's, it's this big hole in the ground, in, incredible cave system underneath. Full of fossils, sloths, mm-hmm. saber tooths. One of the oldest human remains in the Americas is known from this site. Oh. And one of the coolest things that he has found, because he is a bear researcher, which is why that thing was funny before. Yep. He has found Arctotherium, <gasps> the giant South American short faced bear. Oh, they were so big. In this cave, that we're in Central America. <laughs> <laughs> way farther north that's so cool than they have been known before and in the same cave like the same cave that trapped a couple of these bears trapped a person <laughs> <laughs> so some of the earliest american humans got to meet arctotherium <laughs> which oh. was for clarification for the listeners the largest bear of all time yeah as far as we know it it, it was a bear that could look eye to eye to some pachyderms. Yes. <laughs> uh, Blaine actually showed me a video 
Uh, I don't know how, how much I can say about this because I don't know how much of this is public information, but it basically the, the gist is a video from inside the, the sinkhole. There's so much. There's just fossils everywhere. It's huge. There's so much down there. It's really, really cool. I see what the listeners really just got to hear was a big beep as we had to bleep all of that. <laughs> yeah, we bleeped <laughs> it all out. This, this is it's, <laughs> we Blaine went down to on. that cave and he found retracted. Yeah. <laughs> he found absolutely nothing. <laughs> <laughs> some fossils, some cool bears. <laughs> Jesus, Saurus Rex. <laughs> <laughs> There's a whole lot of other cool research that came out of here. I have a whole bunch more notes, but I don't want to spend much more time on it. There, there are a bunch of things that I've written about mm -hmm. since coming away from this that I will post on the blog post in terms of new research, uh, upside-down dinosaurs, and possible dinosaurs sleeping in a communal roost, yeah, and just all sorts of cool stuff. Uh, I'll post a whole bunch more information on the blog post. You can read the articles that I've written about those as well. The theropod dinosaurs get more and more bird-like, or birds reveal more and more of their dinosaur traits. Yes. Way you want to look at those cool things. It's just, there's so much. But one thing that I, I want to highlight from the poster session, so a lot, you know, a lot of this research we've been talking about, it's all science, mm -hmm. right? Hard, like the, the actual research, the actual science. There is a section on the final day of the meeting where there were a, a, a section of the poster room was devoted to education posters. Yes. Posters specifically about projects where people are examining the relationships between paleontology and the public. There was some really cool stuff in the education posters this year. That's awesome. Taya Budhu of the Institute for the Study of Mongolian Dinosaurs had a poster talking about the Movable Museum, which is a museum in a bus right? that they drive around Mongolia to teach kids about dinosaurs. Oh, that's so cool. Which is really neat. That just, ah, uh, that was super cool. There's a, there was a press release about that, mm -hmm. I believe. So uh, we can link that in the blog post as well. Gabe Santos, uh, also of California, had a poster, so he, he works at a museum down there where he, you know, they, they've got all sorts of exhibits and things like that. His poster was about using augmented reality mm -hmm. to enhance exhibits. Absolutely. So augmented reality is when you, you know, you have your phone and you hold your phone camera up to something and the phone displays something over the thing you're looking at. Mm-hmm. It has something that the the phone can reference to and, and interact right. with. Well, it's like uh, Pokemon Go. Yeah. Where it shows you the Pokemon standing on the sidewalk. That's augmented mm -hmm. reality. His poster had augmented reality. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> display. So he had his phone out, and you'd walk up to his poster, and he'd be like, all right, here you go. And you could hold the the phone, the camera, so that it, it, went, it showed a piece of the poster, and, for example, there was a, a little display about Parasaurolophus. Mm -hmm. And when you held it over there, the display would change in the phone viewer to show the internal anatomy and bring up little more, more text about it. Possibly the coolest thing that it did was there was a paragraph that if you held the phone camera over it, it would, on the phone, the paragraph would show up in Spanish. That's so cool. Yeah. That's really awesome. So not only do you get research at, at SVP, you also get the advances in education. Mm -hmm. You get insights into s s what sort of projects people are doing with, with informing the public about stuff. Really cool. Alex Hastings, another Penn State grad, had a poster mm -hmm. about paleontology and comic books. <laughs> uh, Adam Pritchard, who is... Uh, if we have people out there, if you've ever listened to the Pastime podcast, Adam is one of the voices of Pastime. He was presenting a poster with a whole bunch of other colleagues on SVP Reddit AMAs. Mm -hmm. So SVP is, has had been, started a tradition of doing Ask Me Anything uh, Reddit threads yeah. during SVP, which is cool. So there's all, sorts of, there's all sorts of cool educational stuff going on that was being presented at the meeting as well. That's so... And that's... That's a, one of the really cool things about it is it's it's this this willingness to to share 
what one person has figured out so that other people can utilize it too. And even on just things of like, hey, I found a really cool way to teach kids. If yeah. you want to use it, feel free. Yes. Uh, one other that I should point out, especially for anybody who is interested in the the subject of science communication, Sarah L. Shafi, also from California, has been doing all sorts of work in linking science and storytelling. Mm-hmm. She had a poster about this as well, and she also she runs workshops on showing science communicators how to use film and theater approaches to utilize narrative and visual cues and basically the way that cinema folks present information in a way that's engaging and exciting and, and personal to people to use those strategies to communicate science in a way that is exciting. That was one of the things I was initially thinking about when we first mentioned the posters and even the talks is that it's it's fairly easy to put your information on a poster, but I, I never got to make one personally, but many of my colleagues during grad school did make them, mm-hmm. and uh, you have experience with poster making as well. I do. And one of the tricks is that you also have to make it, you know, kind of, it doesn't have to be pretty, but visually pleasing. Like, it has to be something that where your eyes can follow the flow of information and yeah. tell what you're supposed to be reading where and actually find what you're looking for while you're looking at the post. Like there's a bit of design, a bit of graphics design yeah. coming into that. And so this, it's often something that gets ignored when it comes to education is that it has to be palatable. <laughs> you have to be able to yeah. <laughs> at least somewhat enjoy or stomach it for it to get through. And if you can make it truly enjoyable, that's all the better. That's yes. cool. And, and that's a big thing in science communication, whether mm-hmm. you're a scientist or, you know, whether you're writing grants, if you're a journalist, mm-hmm. if you're a podcaster, presenting it in a way that isn't just, here's here's what we found, here's what we were looking for, but making it interesting, right? Because people don't, you know, data is not exciting. No. Stories are exciting. Mm-hmm. Uh, and indeed, if I remember correctly, Sarah's, I don't know if it started, started this way. But at least some of her work started when she reached out to Pixar mm-hmm. to ask for advice on how to use storytelling. Oh, cool. And so she, I think her workshop is a collaboration. At least one of the things she's doing is a collaboration with Pixar. Very cool. So I will, I'll throw that in the blog post as well. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. that's really cool. And that, that's a really, the connecting to stories is a really good point. Um, uh, Scott Swenson is the entertainment advisor at the aquarium Mm -hmm. Uh, he's done a whole whole bunch of stuff with bush gardens and other places with helping them design shows and so on and so forth so on and so forth he does the same thing at the aquarium but one of the things he does is he teaches a couple of classes one's all about courtesy and interaction with the guest and remembering that your even how you're how you're feeling that day though should not affect how you interact with the guest and all blah 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 right right but he does one that's called telling my story and it's all about how if you can put your information you're giving them into a story it will have a bigger impact than yeah. just giving them the inform- that, that a story has a structure people can follow and engages them and invests people into the information they're being given. It's why you can remember the events in a book much more easily than the facts from a textbook. Yes. We say as we present an episode that's mostly just us listing things. <laughs> yes. Yes. No. We, 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 once well, again, we're yeah. presenting it. We're, this, this is good advice. It doesn't yeah. mean we followed it. Do as we, do as we say. Yes. <laughs> so the other stuff happens at SVP, and I, and I do want to mention some of the other cool things that I got mm-hmm. to experience Aside from the research, aside from just meeting cool people, which I did, a few other main sort of attractions. The auction at SVP every year is ridiculous. Oh, it really is. Now, you went to the auction in Raleigh, right? Yeah. So there are two parts of the auction at SVP. So the auction, basically the auction is people donate. There's two parts. There. There's the silent auction and the live auction. Mm-hmm. Silent auction is hundreds of things on tables, it, uh, books, videos, stuffed animals. Uh, Lee Hall donated what has come to be called the Space Yam, 
<laughs> this year. I do not know the story behind it. It's, it was on Twitter. I, it's very confusing. People <laughs> I don't, don't... It's, it's a yam from space. It's space <laughs> That's yam. what it is. It What's confusing about it? <laughs> <laughs> People, all the proceeds go to a charity, and this year it goes to the Legacy League of Funds. Mm-hmm. The live auction has big stuff. A lot of big, yeah, it, casts of, uh, you know, this year the uh, there was a cast of Gorgosaurus skull. Oh, there was what? a cast of a, I think it was a Triceratops skull. Uh, there was the skull of Borealopelta that is up at the Terrell, which I got to see in person Aww. at the Royal Terrell. All man pictures in the blog post, I promise. <sighs> the live auction is done by the auction committee. Mm-hmm. And the auction committee you know, they run the whole, yeah, you know, and it's a live, you know, I $200, 200 do I hear 210 do I hear 210 right? The whole mm-hmm. auction thing. Every year, the auction committee dresses up. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know what started that. When I was in Bristol, they dressed up as Monty Python characters. Mm-hmm. Uh, what was it in Raleigh? Do you remember? I don't, I didn't get to see the live, I remember seeing pictures afterward, but I didn't, I can't remember because I wasn't it's there. It's always something, one year it was Indiana Jones. <laughs> They've done... It's always something new. They go all out. Like we said, there's cosplay at SVP. This is the yeah. cosplay portion. There's the, one group of people... Dorky people love to, love to cosplay. It doesn't matter what context. Super dorky. And they get all dressed up. So I was standing at the auction this year, talking with Lee and Ashley Hall and some other people, and then a song started playing. I turned to see where the music was coming from. A little part of my brain went, oh, that's the song from Guardians of the Galaxy 2. <laughs> And then I turned back to my conversation and didn't think twice about it until about 60 seconds later, where the auction committee came out fully dressed up as characters from Guardians. Oh, that's fantastic. It was cool. Brent was Groot. Scott was Star-Lord. Somebody, I don't remember who, was Yondu with the umbrella. <laughs> It was good. Rebecca Hunt Foster was the cassette tape. Nice. Awesome mix. It was it was ridiculous. They auctioned off a bunch of money. Um, all the things that are auctioned off at the the, the auction are either like the fossil. There's no real fossils auction. Mm-hmm. SVP does officially does not condone the sale of real fossils. Yeah, they they want want them in public collections. Yes. Not. That is a conversation for a different episode. Yes, we'll get to that one later. <laughs> that is a yeah, that's a someday conversation. But the really cool casts, casts that are donated by th- places like uh research casting. Mm-hmm. Treebold Paleontology was there. Uh, I think there were a few others. I have a list. RCI Treebold, other places as well. It's tons of fun. It's an opportunity for people to freak out. It's an opportunity for people to have a lot of fun. It's mm-hmm. an opportunity for somebody to pay an exorbitant amount of money for Paleo Barbie. Yep. <laughs> who shows up every year. <laughs> <laughs> so the Fantastic. auction's a lot of fun. There's also, so in, in as well as there being poster presentations and, and, and poster sections throughout the, 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 the meeting, there's also booths and exhibits. Mm-hmm. So a lot, uh, most times you get those organizations that I mentioned that have casts Mm -hmm. that do fossil casts and and, and things like that have booths. Yeah. So RCI and Treebold Paleo, you can go to their booth and they usually actually will have the auction specimens on display throughout the meeting before they finally go up in the auction. So you get to see them ahead of time, which is a a fun little bit of marketing for them. Mm -hmm. And they make these casts for museum displays and educational materials you usually get book publishers mm-hmm. who have all sorts of books that you can buy on site. I stopped buying books years ago <laughs> because I have a budget <laughs> and I cannot buy books. Because you have to eat. <laughs> <laughs> I have to, because I have to be able to get on the plane back home. Uh-huh. <laughs> there's preparator booths where mm-hmm. you can get – There's uh, there was one uh, – this year there was Dino Light Scopes, which was, oh. I believe, microscopes and similar equipment. Cool. There was a place, and I posted this on Twitter, there was a an organization there called Real World Globes, which has globes, like big globes, that show ancient continental arrangements. And there was one that was a giant, like, 
huge. It was the size. It wasn't the size of a person. It was the size of a child. Mm -hmm. That was the Earth as it is today, but it was a geologic map. Oh, fascinating. So it showed the geologic formations instead of just the, the landscape. That's awesome. Really cool stuff. Oh, that's so cool. Some There's booths for merchandise. Mm -hmm. So there was an organization called Permia, who I will happily plug on the podcast because I bought two of their shirts and I will post pictures of those shirts <laughs> on the blog post. They, it's so cool because on one side of the shirt are skeletal reconstructions done by Scott Hartman. And if you don't know who Scott Hartman is, go look him up. Very, very uh, mm -hmm. admirable paleo artist. And on the other side, there are reconstructions of the animals all fleshed out. Yeah. And they have little stickers, and they have all sorts of cool stuff. Permi is a cool thing. SVP is a great place to stock up on my shirts. Yeah. it's It's got lots of cool stuff. They also have those um, the discussion tables. Yes, they do the round table. Which I really enjoyed. That was one of the things I enjoyed the most when I got to go. What table did you go to? So I went to... So, I, I'm sorry. Yeah. The round table, there, this is an event that they do... Uh, I believe it was on the second day of the conference yes. where they fill a room with different tables. Each table has a theme and anyone, usually students, mm -hmm. the idea is that it's for students, can go to a table and learn about trying to get into grad schools, trying mm -hmm. to get into museum jobs, trying to be uh, a, a, an educator. You know, every table, paleo art. Mm -hmm. is in one table. And that was one of the ones I went to was paleo art because I, mm -hmm. I was intrigued. I wanted to know, you know, what what would get discussed there and everything and it was really interesting because they discussed some of the the common mistakes of paleo art or something where Oh cool. You know, that not not taking in consideration the extra layers of skin over musculature and things like that instead of just coloring straight on neat a muscular you know things like that that I would never have thought of. And then I went to one that was uh, uh, educational outreach because this yep. was when we were still at the museum. So I was like, oh, I might learn some cool trick. Yeah. And yeah, it was really fun stuff. Very much discussion based. Very, you know, they, they were round tables. So everyone was able to ask questions to share their own experiences if they had one and open it up to the person leading the table if they had comments or advice. Yeah, the round table is really fun. When I was started going to SVP, I didn't really appreciate it as much as I do now. Yeah. Last year, I actually, I went to the paleo art table, and that was when I met Scott Hartman. Mm hmm And I went to the science and the media table, mm -hmm. and I sat next to Tom Holtz, and I got to meet in person Brian Switek for the first time, a uh, paleo th journalist. That sounds like a fun table. Yeah, it was cool. I met Mike Habib at that table, too, actually. And this year, I sat down at the outreach table with Gabe Santos for a little bit, mm -hmm. talking about... He does all sorts of crazy outreach and, and cool educational stuff. Cool. He did a, pro, a pro, program with his museum where he dressed up as Professor Oak and taught about the fossil creatures that fossil Pokemon are based on. And you can start <laughs> to get a sense for why I want to hang out with Gabe Santos. <laughs> <laughs> Me too next time. Yeah, right. And I also sat, there was a table specifically about women in paleontology this year. Mm -hmm. There was actually a whole luncheon devoted to this topic on the first day of the conference this year, uh, which I will not talk a whole lot about now, but stay tuned, dear listeners, uh, oh, oh, oh. For, for the future. Teaser drop. Perhaps teaser. Oh, spoilers. <laughs> uh, but I spoke to Ashley Moorhart at that table uh, about issues of, of diversity and issues of, of gender inclusivity mm -hmm. in paleontology, which is really cool. The student roundtable is great. And that, I think, is really the, the big draw of SVP. Like, the research is cool. The, you know, buying cool stuff is neat. The auction is a lot of fun. But getting to sit down and talk to people and meet paleontologists that you know, whose work you admire or meets your potential future advisors or mm -hmm. meet your potential future students. That, that, that The networking aspect of SVP is really the biggest and most exciting thing. Absolutely. Well, and it's, it's cool because, you know, earlier on we compared it to a convention, you know, your typical mm -hmm. nerdy or, or, you know, what have you convention. And it really is a good comparison. The point at which the comparison breaks down is – 
if you go to Comic Con, you know, Joss Whedon or the the cast of the upcoming Avengers film yeah. are gonna be there for a panel or something. You know, some some big name people in the subjects that you're going there for will often be there for a panel. Right. But they're not usually walking around the dealer's hall or the going to the other panels or hanging out at the gaming tables or anything like that. Mm -hmm. At SVP, the people who are the big names in paleontology are there for the exact same reasons that a student is there. Yeah. And you might cross paths with them at the food cart at the sh <laughs> down the street <laughs> <Yeah>. or <laughs> sit next to them in a talk or at a round table. Or so you, you're, you're all there as equals. Like even though some have more experience than others and others are more recognizable, you're mm -hmm. all there for the same reason, for the same purpose, and you're all there experiencing it uh, in the same general ways, which is really cool. It's it's a very yeah. It really brings in the community aspect, which yes. is really it's, it goes into the networking thing, but it's really a cool thing. It makes you feel connected with the subject and the people. A hundred percent. You get to meet. Like I said, this year I met. This year was really funny because this past year has been the first time that I've really been truly active on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And with the podcast, you, we, we're we starting to get involved more in, you know, internet science and education yeah. and stuff. So I went the first day at SVP, I was in a pub down the street from the convention center meeting the people that I know on the internet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so like all these people was like, hey, you're on Twitter and we follow each other and this is what you're like in real life. That was super cool. You get to meet it's cool because I, I I met there were a bunch of undergrads this year that I met mm -hmm. which is really always super exciting to see people who are just starting in their career that's so cool yeah my job because I go as a journalist now I have to interview people right that's part of my job mm -hmm. there and so I get to talk to all sorts of different people about stuff I got to spend 15 minutes chatting with Phil Curry this year which is awesome what a cool Phil Curry's a cool guy Mm -hmm. You know how they say, don't meet your heroes? <laughs> if your hero is Phil Curry, go meet him. <laughs> yep. yep. <laughs> Break that rule. <laughs> so, it's what else? Cool Let place. me see. Are there any other things? There was a an art exhibit this year, which I thought was really, really cool. Oh, that's cool. It was cool. called Picturing the Past, and it depicted artwork from various paleo artists who have made pieces uh, showing all different organisms from all different times and places which was really really cool uh That's getting really paleo cool. art some of the recognition that it deserves which Absolutely. is really neat there were some workshops in the beginning of the conference uh that i unfortunately did not get to go to these were the day before everything officially kicked off workshops about education workshop uh, there was a workshop about diversity in paleontology there were workshops about some sort of methodologies uh so, that's really cool. There's so much. There's so much to talk about at SVP. There were field trips. Uh, every every year, the, the, the conference organizes field trips mm -hmm. that are led by, I think, usually volunteers, uh, people nearby. So the field trips this year, there was one that went to the Burgess Shale. There was one that went to the Royal Terrell Museum. Uh, I did manage to go to the Royal Terrell Museum in Drumheller. Super cool place. If you're ever in Drumheller, go check it out. So it's just, there's so much. There's just... It's it's a it's a big whirlwind. I I feel like this episode was a bit of a whirlwind. Yeah, uh, it, it's it's hard not to be because there is there's so many potential things you can do there. You can never really hit it all. Yeah, in a visit or an episode, but it's it's a cool place and it's it's definitely a landmark event each year because so much can get discussed and revealed and talked about and new connections made. Indeed. At the end of the conference, uh, the very last thing that happens, well, the last thing that happens is that there's an after party where everything gets crazy. No, oh, it's it's hilarious. It's ridiculous. Paleontologists, <laughs> you know, I, I think that there's this tendency to imagine a scientific conference as being a bunch of people all like in suits and lab coats and being all official and being all mm -hmm. professional. And there is definitely a, an air of professionalism. Yeah. But mostly it's just a thousand nerds hanging out talking about science and stuff yeah 
and when the after party happens, they turn on the, you know, they play the Walk the Dinosaur song, and we mm-hmm. all make a conga line, and it's just ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the paleontologists are not the kind of scientists that are looking forward to going to work in suits every day. <laughs> not usually. No, no, no. It's, like I said, cargo pants. It's quite difficult to get us in one of those suits. <laughs> I don't wear suits. <laughs> I, I don't technically own one. <laughs> Actually, I don't know that I... I probably own one somewhere. <laughs> I, I pieced together one last wedding from leftovers of my dad and my brother. <laughs> but before the after party, there is an award ceremony where awards are given out to various folks. And the one thing that I wanted to mention about this award ceremony, I have not told Will this yet. This is the big reveal right here on the podcast. I thought this was oh. really exciting. I sat next to our friend... Blaine Schubert Mm -hmm. of Tennessee. And Dr. Schubert told me that he introduced his father to the Common Descent podcast, and supposedly Mr. Schubert has listened to all the episodes. Oh, what? (laughs) How cool is that? That's the best. So if that is indeed true, hi, Blaine's dad. How you doing? Thanks for listening. (laughs) Thanks for listening to the podcast. That's so great. There are a few different ways to get a shout out on the Common Descent podcast. One of them (laughs) is to be the father of our old professor. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) So if any other family members of our of our colleagues are listening, (laughs) of people who graded our papers. (laughs) Yes, exactly. Uh, we can say whatever we want about Blaine now. He's not grading our papers anymore. Yeah, I, I passed. I got the piece of paper. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> we did it. I identified all the bones you put in front of me after my dissertation. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's all the stuff that I have to say about SVP. Or at the very least, I think that's all the stuff that I'm going to say about SVP. That we have time to say. <laughs> yes, I think that our time is up. But if, like I said, blog post. Lots of pictures, lots of links, lots mm-hmm. more information. There's so much to see. Next year's SVP is in New Mexico. Uh, I, th- I want to say in Albuquerque. Albuquerque. Uh, in Albuquerque. So that should be very exciting. Ghost Ranch is down mm-hmm. there with all the Coelophysis bones. Lots of cool stuff. I want to, you know, I, I kind of want to end, you know, S- we, we make SVP sound like such a cool event, and it is a very, very cool event. Mm-hmm. It is an event attended by paleontologists from all over the world. If you, dear listeners, have a passion, uh, particularly if it's an academic passion, I would highly recommend going to a conference. Yes. It's just, I I mean, SVP is you walk into a a building of a thousand people who are just as obsessed with Mm -hmm. fossils and such as as you are, and there's nothing like that feeling. It's incredible because it it's different from right the anime convention or the or the video game convention and a lot and for the most part. Because it's not just a hobby, right? Paleontology is a career. Granted, those things are, are careers for some people. Yeah, absolutely. But to to walk into this place and just this is th- this is your community. Yeah. Your your official job community. It's super fun. I will say that if you want to go to a scientific conference, if there is one that you're interested in, look them up. Find a small one. Yes. It's less overwhelming, and you will actually be able to afford it. Yes. SVP, for all of its wonderful, wonderful things, is prohibitively expensive. It, it, is, it is quite pricey. It is very difficult to go to. I am fortunate enough that I uh, get some reimbursement for going mm-hmm. because I'm reporting from there. Most people that attend are getting reimbursement from museums or, or, or universities that mm-hmm. they work at. It is not cheap to go to SVP, unfortunately. And, and then, you know, the society uses that money, right? Yeah, it's going it's, to lots of causes. It does make it a little difficult. It definitely, you know, it, it funds everything they do, but, you know, it, if, if, if you decide to go anyway, you better not plan on eating much. <laughs> <laughs> well, you go, my approach is that I go and I say, you know what, I will, I'm going to eat what I want and I'm going to, I'm going to get a couple t-shirts and then Future David will have to deal <laughs> with Take that, future David. Back in New York, David is gonna have it's gonna have to eat ramen. <laughs> yeah, basically. If there's anything else that you listeners wanna know about SVP, like I said, Whirlwind Tour 
through what is a, a jam-packed conference. If there's more you want to know, if if there's more information, things you want to see, pictures you want to see, I might have some. If they don't end up in the blog post, let us know. Let us Absolutely. know what you think. Let us know what your hobbies are. Are there conferences that you have been to? I know there are a bunch of scientists who listen to our, our podcast. What are your favorite conferences? Yeah, Do you have conferences ones. you wish you could go to? Let us know, because I, I've been to a few different conferences, and they're always super, super fun. Mm-hmm. It's it's cool, because we we host them at the aquarium every now and then, and I'm always fascinated when I get to talk with them to be like, what what is this? We yeah. had a, a soda, a, like, soda company conference. Huh. Where they were talking about the different technologies and machines and chemistry and regulations and wow. of making sodas. And it's it's it everything you can think of, there's a conference somewhere for it. That's cool. And it's really interesting and the, the scientific field is no different. Yeah, I've been to GSA, the Geological mm. Society of America, AMQA, which is about and mostly Russia. Ice Age studies. Uh, I also went to one time to the National Science Teachers Association meeting. Mm-hmm. Which was also a lot of fun. Like, like, boy, no one gives presentations like educators. Yep, <laughs> that's that like professional educators. It, that's that's some good stuff. <laughs> so yeah, let us know what you want to hear more about. As is always the case, we are always taking suggestions. If you have follow up questions, if you have suggestions for episode topics you want to to, to hear about. If you have feedback, anything you want to tell us, mm-hmm. let us know. Get us on Twitter. Get us on Facebook. Leave us iTunes reviews and ratings. Those actually really help uh, us to get a sense of not only what our listeners think, but also help spread the word through platforms uh, like mm-hmm. iTunes, Podbean, things like that. And if you'd like to contribute financially, please, again, consider joining us on Patreon if you are so inclined. We at the Common Descent Podcast release new episodes every fortnight. Yarp. So stay tuned for two weeks from now, episode 18, about the next topic. Thanks for sticking around, everyone. Hope you enjoyed. Thank you very much. We will be back for SVP Part 2 in New Mexico, hopefully next year. Hopefully both of us. Fingers yes, crossed. oh boy, that would be good. Oh, fingers crossed. Yeah, we'll see what we can do. Adios, folks. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. For more from us, you can follow us on the Common Descent Podcast Twitter account, Facebook page, or on our WordPress blog, where we post additional cool stuff for each episode. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome. You can find this and other video game remix music at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope to see you next time. Thank you.